Are the markets too pessimistic or optimistic about what's going on in the world right now? Well, look, there's clearly a lot of volatility, and we saw that yesterday. Yesterday was obviously a very, very tough, tough day in the markets. Yeah, and it's a, it's a good question because the underlying economic growth continues to be, you look at the U.S., just below 2% there or thereabouts, so that's essentially on trend. But clearly there's a convergence of issues going on right now. There's some of the data out of the U.S. recently has not been so good. We've seen bad J German data. So negative data, point one. Point two, these issues around trade, Yesterday, obviously, we had the Airbus and the tariffs and the WTO ruling. So, so the whole trade discussion has been escalated. It's beyond U.S.-China now. It's U.S.-Europe. And so there's that series of issues. And clearly, the market pulled back. You've also got to, on days like that, separate the technical moves from the fundamental moves. Um, talk to me about you know, your commitment to Europe. Are you, are you hiring anyone to actually expand in, in wealth management in the region? Absolutely. Wealth management growth is one of our priorities. You've seen that us in the U.S. Making, making an acquisition. We continue to hire um, coverage people, client-facing people. We continue to build that business. I was in Switzerland last week, actually. We just opened a new office in Geneva to expand our wealth management capabilities there. So wealth management is a huge priority, and, and Europe is very much part of that. Are, are you worried about Europe at all? So you have negative rates. Are you, what are your clients telling you? Are they worried about investing? Do they want to you know, go to cash instead of actually you know, you know, making, putting their money to work with you? Well, I mean, there are two questions there. I mean, the first is activity levels across Europe. Look, capital markets are wide open. They're wide open in the U.S. They're certainly wide open in Europe. We see, a, if you look at the amount of debt financing through the month of September, really at record levels, and that's both investment grade and high, high yield. The equity market's open. We priced two great transactions last week. You know, one for Team Viewer, a technology software company out of Germany, EQT up in Scandinavia. So the, the equity markets are there to support companies. And there's really a decent amount of M&A activity. So, so markets are open. You know, there's lots of movement in the secondary markets. So actually, b underlying business performance for us in Europe continues to be you know, really pretty, pretty healthy. You know, the broader economy, you'd obviously like it to be stronger. Ma Germany, which is the big one, of course, manufacturing weaker. You know, that's partly China, just a, a slowdown in global manufacturing data, and you've seen that. Contrast to the U.S., of course, where the consumer is really the dominant player. Do you worry about the financial system in Europe? And I don't know whether that's because of negative rates or actually something happening, you know, such as a, a no-deal Brexit that could seize up the markets. I don't think so. I, I, th I think the authorities you know, on both sides of the channel are very much focused on the preparations for a no-deal Brexit. People were ready in March. They're more ready now that you get to the end of October. And I think the really important issue is going to be the immediate aftermath. And so what happens in those first two weeks in November, assuming we have a no-deal Brexit? What happens? In the, do those go well or do they not go well? Because those are going to be the weeks that really set the tone should people, you know, did people underestimate the issues, or, or, or was there too much noise when they didn't need to be? And if those two weeks go well, confidence will build and will grow. And the authorities know that. And so the central banks on both sides will be there with liquidity. I think the governments and the authorities on both sides will be there to support and to minis minimize the downside. How is Goldman Sachs preparing for a no deal? Do you have extra traders on, you know, on the evening for volatility if something happens? It'll be more than the evening. It'll be all night through. We we'll absolutely will have, you know, we'll be fully staffed up, you know, 24 hours, and, and, and that'll run for as long as, it needs, uh, as long as it needs to run, which is what we would do for each of these big events, and we've had many over, over recent years, as we know. Um, Richard, when you look at Saudi Arabia, how much of this is an opportunity for Goldman Sachs, for business there? Yeah, it's terrific. We, we opened a uh, secondary equity business in Saudi earlier this year. That's gone very, very well. We've got great market shares. Obviously, the Saudi Aramco win, you know, we, alongside a number of other institutions, you know, on the top line of, of that transaction. You know, when this happens, and they haven't determined exactly the date of that transaction yet, but when this happens, this is likely to be the biggest IPO that we've, we've ever seen. It's a great, great company. So we look forward to that. But we active away from that, too. We did a billion dollars for Samba, one of the big banks, last week. We've been involved in a number of M&A transactions. And so, you know, broadly across the region, you know, we, we're active. We continue to have, you know, a great cl client franchise down there. And what's your commitment like to China? So I know you were very involved also in buying back, you know, part of a joint venture. But do you worry that the trade dispute actually means that financial, U.S. financial companies may be locked out of China at some point? Yeah, we, 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 there are certain things we may not be able to control, and we'll have to deal with them if they happen. Our focus right now is making sure that we're absolutely focused on our Chinese client base. And it's a big and it's a broad client base. We've been there for a long period of time. 
Uh, and we've led many of the innovations in the Chinese market. I think our, our reputation amongst the Chinese corporate community, amongst the Chinese government community is very, very strong. And we'll continue to build on that. And we, you know, we're there to help develop the capital markets. It's critical for the long-term growth of the Chinese economy that they have an efficient financial system, they have capital markets that function, that will attract foreign capital as well as service the domestic requirements. And we want to play our part in that. And that's what we're committed on doing. What do you see you know, going on with US-China trade? Are we going to fund an agreement, or are we going to be in this you know, boiling over, like two steps forwards, one step backwards um, for, the, for the next it, decade? It, it, well, it, it feels a bit more back and forth you know, for a period of time. Look, these are two of the world's great economies. They're going to continue to the good news is that they're trading. And as long as these two economies continue to trade, there will be tensions. These are major blocks. Their issues will diverge from time to time. Look, put yourself in the US's position. Essentially, what the US is trying to do is renegotiate its supply lines. And if it can get better terms of trade, that's good for the US economy. That's what they're trying to do. China's trying to protect its own interests. And I think you'll have those tensions. The important thing is they continue to trade, and they continue to talk. Uh, and on that basis, I think we can, we, we can move forward. And there will be agreements along the way, but I'm sure there's going to be no such thing as a permanent agreement. Um, I want to talk to you about 1MDB. Mm -hmm. What kind of steps have you taken with Abu Dhabi following the, the 1MDB scandal? Well, we continue to have good relationships in Abu Dhabi. We continue to do business in Abu Dhabi, as we do right across the region. <clears throat> but I'm sure they, like us, would like to put this, put this behind us. And we're obviously working with the relevant authorities around the world to you know, try and reach a suitable resolution to this issue. How close are you to finding a resolution with Malaysia? I, you know, these things have to run their natural course. And you know, the work is ongoing. And it'll happen at the right time. Um, Richard, very quickly on sustainability, you have this great new building in London. How, you know, is this a strong commitment to London and, and to a more sustainable London? It's a very important point. We spent a billion pounds on, on this building. Um, it's a real commitment. We can put 7,000 people into this facility. So we're going to be in London. We're backing London as a financial center in the long term.